We're going to get going. Uh, everyone that's here, uh, thanks for joining. I'm Brian Chaplin, the founder of Medicine Box, with our mission to co-create interconnectedness in human health and happiness while harmonizing our relationship with Mother Earth. And today, I'm super excited to have Mara Gordon on here with us. Uh, she is not only a colleague, a mentor, advisor, uh, she's also a friend, someone that I tremendously respect uh, as a human being, as well as the work that she's been putting forth for what seems like eons, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, if everyone could save their questions for the end uh, and just as questions come up, drop them in the chat. Uh, let's get everyone's audio uh, on mute. And we have a really good program today. Mara is a wealth of information. Uh, her bio is, I, I just want to read the whole bio just because it's so stellar. Uh, it's one of probably uh, a couple dozen bios. Uh, so Mara Gordon is a cannabis advocate, entrepreneur, and researcher. She has harnessed her background as a process engineer to create therapeutic dosing res regimens for thousands of patients around the world, drastically improving their health, quality of life, and longevity. Mara openly shares her knowledge about the therapeutic benefits of the cannabis plant whether consulting with medical teams through TEDx talks or calling out hyperbole in the industry she cares so deeply about. I love that one. Mara rose to prominence through the company she co-founded, Aunt Zelda's. Back in 2011, Aunt Zelda's operated as a collective, bringing bespoke cannabis formulations to patients. As additional regulations were introduced in California, Mara standardized her most popular therapeutic oil blends, making them commercially available to patients through the respected Aunt Zelda's brand. With science as her North Star, Mara has pursued data-driven plant-based medicine for numerous maladies, seeking to engage a larger, larger medical and patient community, as well as to place the practice of medicine back into the hands of qualified medical practitioners. Mara launched Cala Spring Wellness, a telemedicine platform and clinical service utilized by physicians and nurses to guide them on incorporating cannabinoid-based medicines into their standard treatment plans. Cala Spring Wellness is fueled by her careful data collection through Aunt Zelda's, along with years of research and development and consultation with knowledgeable physicians and world-renowned researchers. Unlike other pharmaceutical drugs with recommended dosage protocols, former formal clinical research on cannabis has been unavailable in the U.S. because of its classification as a Schedule One drug, resulting in more anecdotal than factual information. Unwilling to be stimmied by federal laws, Mara co-founded Zelda Therapeutics in Australia. The company brings together some of the world's leading researchers and clinicians active in the study and use of medicinal cannabis to treat a variety of ailments. Presently, Zelda is engaged in preclinical research for multiple forms of cancer and diabetes-related cognitive decline, as well as clinical trials for autism, chronic pain, and insomnia. As interest in cannabis spreads, Mara continues to be an outspoken leader in the medical cannabis space. She has appeared on stage in front of audiences nationally and internationally, and sometimes even stages she doesn't even know she's going to be on, which she just told me, and was featured in the films The Medicine of Marijuana, Mary Jane's Women of Weed, and the award-winning documentary Weed the People. Uh, there is so much more likely in that bio and I always like to tell a good story. Uh, I met Mara in 2016, I believe, at HempCon. I think that was in uh, Santa Rosa where they hold the uh, esteemed Emerald Cup. It was a couple months after I launched Medicine Box. I had no idea what I was doing. I had a really uh, snazzy booth. Uh, you can see the, the upcycled wood behind me. That's part of the booth there. And uh, we were positioned right across from from Mar and we were selling edibles and tinctures at the time. And uh, I remember walking over a little bit starstruck because it was Aunt Zelda's and Mara and she had all her formulations up and the primary, prim primarily formulations of THC. So that's really what we're going to drop into today because Mara is someone that uh, I believe um, is one of the most well-versed in uh, THC medicine applications and data-driven uh, anecdotal evidence. And 
uh, Mara was very, if you remember that, you were very nice to me and answered all my questions that I had. And over the last several years, we've just become fast friends and someone that um, I can rely on to uh, have conversations with and run ideas by and get some really sound advice. So uh, dropping right in here, Mara, tell us about where you see the industry. I mean, you've been in the field for a decade. Uh, which makes you a true old schooler, OG back 2011, maybe even before that, uh, which is like centuries in the cannabis space. And uh, tell us about where the company is now compared to where it started and uh, where you ended up focusing on um, in terms of products and services. Well, first of all, Brian, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm thrilled. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of yours and of Medicine Box both. And I love the work you're doing and getting education and getting the right kind of messaging out there. Um, so first to look at where the industry is from my perspective today. Um, I think it's an absolute mess, um, uh, especially in when I look at places like California um, actually, it's it's pretty well everywhere in the U.S. that it's been it's been quite frustrating and disappointing. Um, we have the opportunity to roll out a set of medicines to help a an awful lot of patients. And, I mean, an unlimited number of patients, really, because of the way that the endocannabinoid system works and interacts with other systems in the body. And I agree that people should be able to make their own medicine, use it to recreate, and do all those things. But the way that it has been legalized and rolled out in California, which is where I'll focus for this particular topic right now, um, has it's like recreational or adult use became uh, allowed and available and it just kicked the medical to the curb. Now, I have a lot of, of theories about why that is. Uh, one of them being the, the, the type of vernacular that we used all these years around medical cannabis and having a license and having a permit to use it and having a card. People looked at that as a wink, wink, let's get out of jail free card. Instead of the reality of there are products that are more appropriate and, and uh, approaches to medicating for a medical audience than there is for the adult use. I've seen so much of the money and the investment and the product development be focused over to the adult use and rec with this huge entree to the industry by uh, consumer packaged good professionals and marketing folks in over uh, pharmacists, chemists, uh, botanists, things like that, that I would rather see being leading the way. Um, when they added all the layers of taxation and regulation on top of it, and I'm a huge proponent of regulatory regulation, as anyone that's followed any of the work I've done over these years will know that. But the layers of, of, of uh, barriers to, to entry into, this, into the industry and the sheer amount of money that it takes to not only get in the industry, but because of the added layers, what it then gets passed on to the consumer, it has priced so many of them out of the market where they're all backed. What is it in California, 80% of cannabis users are, are, are underground, gray market, mm -hmm. not legal. So how has that been successful? So we already, a lot of us were already lab testing. A lot of us were already doing all these things. And now people are being forced into markets that are not necessarily as beneficial. Right. So um, the second half of your question about what, where my piece of this is now is, you know, Aunt Zelda's had always been a, a custom, a, a, a set of products that were utilized by patients so that we were getting the feedback on the data, what was working, what wasn't working. So it's, it's anecdotal, but it's a slightly higher level of it's more empirical because you had physicians recommending it, creating a dosing protocol, patients uh, abiding by it, giving feedback on what's working and what's not, and then being able to make adjustments, utilize that information and apply it to the next set of patients. And that's really what it's always been about. Once the once Prop 64 passed, we were no longer allowed to exist as a, a legal collective where we work this way one on one. All of a sudden, there were all these layers between us as a licensed manufacturer 
and the uh, consumer that had to go through a distributor and a retailer and and I didn't had no interest in going after a whole huge set of licenses. So um, I pulled back on the manufacturing of, of Aunt Zelda's and I'm waiting to re bring it out with our new platform for medical professionals as a way of supporting it on the back end. Medicine Box will be on the back end as well. So yeah, so I mean, really, until we can get to where these products are not about, you know, who has the, the most money for marketing and who has the biggest budget and who knows all the bud tenders to get in on the shelves, it, it's just not medicine. It, you can't compete on the shelves as a serious medicine along with all these products that have huge budgets behind them for the adult use. I agree with that. And uh, we, you know, thanks for mentioning Medicine Box. I mean, we think of ourselves as your colleagues and you know, oh, yeah. what sort of businesses uh, do you respect in the space and, and why? Like what, what are some of these businesses that you put on the back end of what you just spoke about? Well, yours. And I have to take a look at Levi's products to see what he's doing and how that's going. Um, I, I think that there are certain products that I see. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to be exclusionary at the same time that I'm including in the ones that I'll mention. There are some brands though, that I, I feel like the ethos is very strong. Um, uh, uh, I think that Fiddler's Green is making some good products. Um, I, I mean, there's some down in LA that I need to check out. I think that uh, the products that Monica Violpondo makes are very good. Um, some of the Kiva products are very good and uh, of great benefit to medical patients when they're on a very, very low dose and they have an aversion to using any kind of a tincture or something. Um, there's, a, there's a slew. There are so many brands right now out there and we're going to be doing a deep dive based upon the COAs for each and every product yep. to see and then test them against them to make sure that they actually are what they say on their labels and on their COAs. So a strict due diligence process. Very strict due diligence. Yeah. That's good. Uh, so your TEDx talk, you said that THC is a good medicine. The other one, CBD, isn't. What makes THC the superior medicine? We have, we have, I, I, oh my is, God, <laughs> I've gotten so much pushback on that. Yeah. Okay. So it's not that CBD is bad. It's the way that CBD is being, has been rolled out in hype that is bad. A molecule can't be bad and it's yeah. a great benefit. And frankly, we recommend it. Um, I say, you know, it's more like a prescription, you know, we prescribe or recommend it to patients along with THC and very, very rarely without THC. What I meant by that was, you know, I, well, I'll give you an example. I was on a, I was on a, giving a lecture last week for a educational platform out of Brazil that I'm part of. Um, we can Academy, we teach doctors strictly it's for physicians. And there was a doctor on there from Florida and she kept going on about how CBD is good and THC is bad. And, you know, patient, nobody should ever use more than three milligrams of THC for anything. And I thought that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. That's somebody who's buying into the hype and has completely let go of the fact that what it means to have psychoactivity, what does that actually even mean? You know, I'm drinking a cup of green tea that's, that's going to stimulate me. So is that psychoactivity? You know, if I take something that relaxes me, is that psychoactivity? So CBD, you can't have it both ways. You can't say CBD is the good one and THC is the bad one and then say that it's good because it's, uh, it's you know, for insomnia and anxiety and all the claims they make about it, which I haven't found to be true in most cases. But... So if, you, if you're anxious and then you take something and you're no longer anxious, what's happened? You know, is there activity going on in your psyche that is now creating a difference in your state of being, right? So it, it's, it's, it's inauthentic and it's, it's hype that's been pushed by the CBD hemp hustlers and the CBD uh, companies that only have CBD. 
Now, if there's a state that only has CBD available, then you know you do your best to work with that. I had a woman that came to me. She was sent to me by a CEO of a big cannabis company just about a week ago. And she's in Georgia. She has uh, uh, stage four cancer and she wants to know what to take and how to take it. So we we're able to do a, an intake with her and look it all around. And when I started looking at what was available in Georgia, it's all under 0.3 uh, percent THC. So it's, it's strictly hemp CBD products. And, um, you know, I told her, I said, we can get as close as we can, but they're not being manufactured to my specifications. They're not being, uh, they don't, you know, what they call full spectrum is not necessarily what I call full spectrum. THC is the heavy lifter of cannabis. THC is the one that is the, is the crowning jewel of the cannabis plant, as far as I'm concerned. And what I've seen with tens of thousands of patients that we've helped over the years. Um, most of them would not have been helped by CBD alone. And I'm kind of the canary in the coal mine. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm still a low dose, lightweight person. I use cannabis every day of my life, but I'm very typical of a lot of people. And CBD makes me feel awful, just awful. And THC makes, you know, helps me sleep, gets me out of pain, does all the things I need it to do. And you think they're the, the combination of both are kind of this, this sweet kind of marriage there. It's not 100%. Like THC versus CBD or CBD versus THC. It's both of them together. Well, it's both of them together. Or if you only can have one, I'll take the THC. Yeah. Fair now, enough. yeah, when, we, when we're looking at treating cancer patients, for example, most of the time we do some sort of a ratio of a one-to-one -one of both of them. And just because they each work differently on, on cancer cells for apoptosis and effigy. So you want to make sure you have both. And then in certain types of cancers, we might even have twice as much CBD as THC. But for the vast majority of people, the THC is the heavy lifter. I like that. THC is the heavy lifter. So let's talk about dosing with uh, THC and its variants. At, at Medicine Box, we have uh, something that we say every body is different and everybody is different. But some people listening to this uh, may not have knowledgeable people to go to for support. Right. Right. And if you're starting out with chronic pain, for example, where's the best place to start? So one of the things I've talked about many times when I've given lectures is about the fact that our data shows that there's more of a correlation between the age of the patient than the weight of the patient on what their dose would be. Um, so it, I, would have to, I would have to ask some qualifying questions to be able to give you any kind of a, you know, uh, you know it's, like, it's like, what's the meaning of life standing on one foot? On the other hand, everybody should start extremely low. First, you have to know if somebody is cannabis naive, if they have experience with it, you know, what other pharmaceuticals they're on, all that sort of thing. You have to look to make sure there aren't uh, contraindications because they are on a... Um, a, uh, a pharmaceutical that is metabolized through the cytochrome P450 or something like that. So assuming that they're, you know, they don't have any adverse reactions, they have no drugs that they're taking presently that would bar them from doing it. I never really started in anybody any uh, higher than like one milligram. And I only do that so that we can assess whether there's a response. Um, uh, if somebody starts out at five milligrams uh, you don't know whether, and it's too much, you don't know how far to go down. And if somebody is suffering with pain, for example, and we give them one milligram, now let me, let me emphasize here, I'm not talking about an isolate or a distillate here. I'm talking about a full plant, uh, whole plant extract here or infusion of some sort, yeah. So if they start with one milligram and they feel nothing, then tomorrow let's try 2.5 milligrams or let's go up to three milligrams. But it's amazing how many people will feel, they don't feel the, the, the one milligram, but they feel less pain. So you want to increase very, very slowly to get to somebody to a, uh, what I consider a therapeutic dose. And a therapeutic dose is meeting the objective they've established for themselves with their intention on how they're using the medicine. So you taking start low and go slow to a whole new level. 
Oh yeah. Sure, with one milligram. Right. I mean, we have. I have some elderly people. You know, Aunt Zelda's products came in ten milligrams per mil, thirty gram milligrams per mil, and then the extract, which is you know seven or eight hundred milligrams per mil. I, I had elderly people sometimes that I would start them on the 10 milligrams per mil and I would have them on one drop, which was a third of a milligram. Because if they've never tried cannabis before or they tried it, you know, 40 years ago and they're, you know, then it's going to impact them differently. A lot of times the very first time you give them cannabis, they don't feel anything because the, it's never, their endogenous cannabinoid system hasn't been engaged. So interesting that um, that you have to you have to uh, identify where their starting point is as far as where they are in experiencing cannabis previously. But you know, start somebody at a third of milligram. It sounds crazy, but you know, it, everybody's different. I, the average person, you start at one. If they have cannabis experience in the past, uh, whether smoking it or you know, edibles or something. Um, I might start them at 2.5 uh, or two milligrams or something like that, but I always believe you should start slowly and increase because on a medical, you aren't looking to create a, an awareness of psychoactivity necessarily. You're trying to just relieve some sort of symptoms. Right. And, and just for clarity for the listeners out there, you mentioned that uh, the, the one milligram dose or whatever uh, dose we're using is a full spectrum, whole plant extract, not a distillate, not an isolate. You wanna to speak to that just a little bit? Yeah, well, um, uh, we published an article back in 2018 on the entourage effect and its, its impact on treating uh, the three major subtypes of breast cancer. And there's no question that utilizing a whole plant where it has the full spectrum and not the, the way it's, well, let me, using full spectrum um, uh, has an incredibly uh, beneficial effect that you just don't see in the single molecule. Now, unfortunately, the term full spectrum has been hijacked by the industry in many ways. And as a result, you have um, people talking about full spectrum where they've taken an isolate and they've added in five terpenes and they're calling yeah. it full spectrum. That no, that's not a full spectrum, that's Frankenstein. You know, that's yeah. nothing, yeah. Yeah, there's full spectrum. I mean, when you jump over into the hemp space, there's hemp cannabinoid uh, manufacturers that are calling full spectrum, broad spectrum, then there's distillates, and then there's isolates, and it's all like Frankenstein. But I think right. the world we come from is it's all about the plant, the whole plant, nothing but the plant. And, exactly. Right. Then that full right. spectrum also has a suite of minor cannabinoids. Uh, and there and other fats, lipids, minerals. And, um, you know, this month that we've been focusing on medicine box, the future of cannabinoids, some of the more minor cannabinoids such as THCV and THCA. And, and how do they rank in terms of their efficacy for your patients? Well, um, THCV is one of the most exciting uh, uh, ones that, that uh, I've had the opportunity to work with back in, um, I want to say 2011, 2012, we had a grower that worked for us who was specializing in THCV. She had a, uh, she had a, a variety that she had brought back from, from Africa. Mm -hmm. And we were having tremendous uh, success with people who were utilizing C or trying to use CBD dominant medicines uh, against like with diabetes and uh, uh, appetite suppressant, things like that. And they would end up using um, THCV and find that they would have more of a sense of well being at the same time that they had uh, uh, blocked their appetite. And also, um, it's an in insulin modulator. So that it's very, very promising for people that are, that are dealing with diabetes. Um, in fact, there's a study that I know that, that they contacted me about helping them on the formulation of the dosing that's going on in India, utilizing THCV because diabetes is pretty much an epidemic. Uh, uh, you don't want to use those terms anymore, like pandemic, yeah. epidemic, things like that, but it's, it's, it's far too prevalent. Yes, it's a crisis there. Uh, THCA, it's another one that's like 
Now, let me just say that on the THCV, let's go back there for just a minute, if I may. Yeah. If you look at it, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a scientist. I'm not a biologist or chemist or any of that. But uh, I'm, a, I'm just an engineer looking at the data and, and, you know, and making conclusions. Um, but if you look at the, at the actual uh, 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 THCV, the, it is a CB1, it's a weaker CB1 antagonist than CB2 agonist. And as a result, you're not going to have the same level of psychoactivity because most of the CB1 receptors are in the central nervous system and in the brain, unlike the CB2, which are more in your peripheral uh, organs and your immune system. So that might be ex the explanation as to why. Now, THCA is tremendously uh, beneficial in many, many cases. Over the years, we've had um, a myriad of patients come to us with um, uh, epilepsy, uh, autism, uh, Tourette syndrome, um, and other disorders on the, of this sort. And they have been able to use CBD in many cases initially, and then the CBD stops working. And we found that THCA works very, very well to help uh, to keep some of the seizure disorders and things like that. Uh, and I mean, if I had a choice, if I had, God forbid, I had a child or grandchild with seizures and they said, you have THCA as an option or you have CBD alone as an option, I would take THCA. Also on anybody with gut issues, anybody who has um, any kind of digestive issues and all THCA is tremendously uh, promising for that as well. Um, you know, the, 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 the gut is the second brain and uh, many, many autistic uh, um, uh, people with autism uh, have gut issues. So that's also part of the explanation I think of why it might, it might be helpful. Sounds very promising. And oh yeah. Speaking of uh, hyperbole, this this could be your chance to call out some of this stuff in the industry. How about delta eight? We're starting to see not just delta eight THC, but also also delta eight THCV, and all down the line, and even talk of delta ten. Right. Does that make a difference as far as medicine is concerned? And you can just call out this Delta because I know you and I have had a conversation yeah. around this about the hemp hustlers and just a way to, uh, you know, utilize that gray area and the, and the, the laws to just make some money, but also maybe endanger folks at the same time with the manufacturing processes. Oh yeah. So uh, Delta eight, I love Delta eight. I think it's absolutely a fantastic. I love the way it makes me feel. I love mm -hmm. the way that, I mean, I don't have anything bad to say about it. Like I said, it's a molecule. I mean, yeah. you know, it's a molecule. It's, you know, you can't have a, a bad feel. How, molecules can't be good or bad. They just are what they are. What has happened though, is that the people in the hemp industry are seeing that the CBD craze is a failure from a business standpoint, it's a, it's yeah. a failure. Um, and so they're looking for a way to monopolize or, or exploit what they already have been doing in their systems, in their markets by introducing this novel, which isn't novel, it's always been there, Delta-8. Um, and they're making claims that, uh, that Delta-8 is not covered by the Marijuana uh, Tax Act, that it's actually under the hemp bill because it's not, it only talks about THC and this isn't THC. Well, yes, it is, it's THC. It's, it's, uh, it's still THC, it's just a different, it, it, like I, the, the same number of car, uh, carbon molecules, they're just in different places, you know, uh, they share their isomers, so they're, they're the same. Where I have a real problem with Delta-8 is the fact that they are trying to separate it out. And because it has such tremendous medical benefit potential for many people, it needs to be regulated so that it's safe. 
and so that it's consistent and so that the labeling is in place and all those things. And that's not happening on the hemp side at all. So um, they're, they're trying to hijack basically uh, and go around, it, 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 you know, it's, it, it's very Eddie Haskell-ish for anybody that remembers, you know, Leave it to Beaver. It's very, you know, it's just not, it just makes you feel icky when you think about the fact that they're exploiting uh, potentially really sick people and, and for profit in a way that doesn't take into account what's necessary to keep it safe. Um, Delta 8 has tremendous uh, uh, possibilities and, you know, it is a weaker um, agonist in some ways. So it's a different type of psychoactivity. So it's a lesser, you know, at the same yeah. time. The, the, the feeling I get when I've used Delta 8 on its own is uh, a little bit less psychoactivity, but very much uh, in the body like a real body experience. Um, oh. I've also used it um, in synergy with Delta 9 in CBD in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio with the atomizer um, uh, with a nano emulsion. And that creates a very uh, interesting effect. It's very cerebral, but also like very in my body. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the other medical benefits that that you see or what what's your personal experience with delta 8 how does it make you feel it makes me feel um better and i know that that's kind of uh <laughs> what does that mean but i mean i can be having a, a low energy day i can be feeling exhausted my head hurts my pain is bad i don't feel like doing anything and I can uh, take Delta-8 in a, in a relatively small dose compared to maybe what you'd have to do with CBD or something. And I feel like I can pretty well do anything, but I don't feel abnormal. I don't feel uh, altered in a sense where I don't feel like I could still, you know, conduct business and be in a meeting and do anything else that I wanna do. Um, I don't know if I would drive a car, but then again, I don't really drive anyway. So nobody wants me on the road. <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah. yeah. And with the, with Delta eight, you know, it's like speaking to that, the patient on the East coast, I think you mentioned that mm -hmm. cancer, uh, and the, the less than 0.3% THC in some of those formulations. Now, if, you use that formulation in combination with some Delta eight with the Delta eight help with that, uh, the synergy of the entourage effect or right. would you really want that Delta nine? Because I think there's ways uh, to use Delta eight, uh, you know, as more of that, that mechanism, that, that key that unlocks the CD one receptor for the entourage effect to really take hold. Well, that's a very good question. First, I would say that um, I've been saying all along that Delta 8, like I said before, should be included just like anything else in, in cannabis and needs to be regulated. And it's not, it's not an accepted part of the, the farm bill. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the DEA agrees with me. And even Bob Hoban, you know, Bob Hoban from you know, the largest law firm in, the, in this space, he even came out and said, look, you guys, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not included. It is illegal to be selling it across state lines and doing it non-regulated. It's not part of the farm bill. So that wouldn't help this woman in, uh, on the East Coast, unfortunately. However, yeah. if she had the opportunity you know, to get a hold of it, I would certainly recommend that she do that and, and try it. Um, obviously, I would rather that she had Delta 9 uh, yeah. just because we already have enough studies that we've done to see how it works in the particular type of cancer she has. Um, at least, you know, uh, part of it's anecdotal, part of it's preclinical, but we've seen enough um, to have some confidence. I, there are some very, very limited studies that have been done with Delta-8, but nothing yet that, that, that moves the meter for me on the fact that it is or isn't as eff uh, effective in killing cancer cells. Um, so that, that's, that's part of it. Obviously you always want to have, you know, full spectrum, whole plant when you're dealing with treating serious diseases. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we have to work, worry about things like standardization so that each time you take it, it's similar enough that it's not going to throw you for a loop. Um, obviously, there can be slight variances because it's a whole plant, but that shouldn't scare anybody away from it. I think Delta 8 has tremendous problem, uh, promise. I would love to see more research being done around it. And I'd like to see more of it being um, uh, uh, developed in, within the plants themselves. Right. Now, I like what you said about uh, it's neither good, neither bad. It's just a molecule. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and now, speaking of molecules, THCP, what should people know about that? That's kind of this new, new trend because all the folks that love high THC strains are like, we can even go higher than 37% or 42% or whatever some of these ones are. How do you feel about that? So I, I don't have enough information to be to have an opinion yet on it. So I'm just going to say that the, it, the, the jury is out on it for me. On the other hand, on the same side that you're for full spectrum and whole plant medicine, you're dealing with a medicine that has a 100% value. The more you go up on one is the more you're going down in others. And because we don't know yet what the true benefit or is of the different cannabinoids that we don't haven't even identified yet, and the terpenes and flavonoids that we haven't even identified yet, the more you go up on the THC, the, the more you're going down on these other components within it. You know, when people talk about, they brag about the fact that they were able to do an extract that had 90% THC, I'm like, oh, bummer. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, you know, there's not much room there once you have the, you know, the fats and the waxes and the, you know, for all those things for the rest of it to make it full spectrum. I mean, I think once you go above like 80, 80 some odd percent, you're not leaving enough room for the, what would be a full spectrum. So right. I think that they just need to, you know, take into account what they're losing by, by pushing up the THC so much. Right, and different markets, and probably different consumers, but uh, yeah, I mean the same on. people that yeah, the do the right. dabs of the hundred percent isolate, and, you know exactly. So yeah, I like that too. Is like the the more you go up on one, the the less you have available for right. other cannabinoids and, and trace elements there. Um, so like Medicine Box, you work with extracts, uh, whole plant. Uh, Tell us about your process for designing medicines and, and how does that differ from the way a big pharma would design? Yeah. Well, there, there's a thread on um, LinkedIn right now where somebody posted a, a study that we published. It was part of Zalera Therapeutics, of course, but it was on our insomnia study. Now, the formulation that I had created at Aunt Zelda's and used it on, I don't even know how many thousands of patients over the years for insomnia. We had enough data to have an idea of what the profile in general of the major components of the medicine needed to be as far as cannabinoids and terpenes and, and ratios of those to each other. And to, in order to justify the expense of doing a trial, which is outrageously expensive, Mm -hmm. And we then came out with a product called Zenoval, which is a, uh, a it's been through to uh, be and on trials and Australia, which is where we are already released, um, has a special designation for uh, herbal concoctions that's different than what we have here in the US. The level of, of trialing and everything and purity is different. In the US, so anyway, the reason I bring up this, this, this study on the LinkedIn is this MD who is a, who does clinical trials as part of his, his that's his job, that's all he does. He's yeah. giving us SMAC because it's not a single molecule. It's not, you know, we can't tell you every single solitary terpene and other cannabinoids that are in there. There's just no way to know. You know, I mean, we know a lot, but we don't know what we don't know. And I have no interest in reducing a product down to this Frankenstein, you know, one, one cannabinoid, 
five terpenes and call it a drug. So um, what I do when I study to create a new formulation is I look at the potential health benefits of the various terpenes and what they are when they stand on their own. And then I look at the various cannabinoids and what their uses are and where their, their interactions are. And then create like what, what would be the best synergistically, the best combination. And then look out there at the cultivars that are out there already in the market and find out like, for example, I talk a lot about the purples and utilizing the purples for, for uh, anti-tumor, anti-cancer and for sleep. Uh, so in sleep in particular, the, the purples often, often, not always, are high in myrcene and linalool, um, and, and also in beta caryophylline. Now, beta caryophylline is an interesting terpene because it's, it's one of the, I think the only one that, uh, or close to it, that also activates the CB2 receptors. So you My topical, for example, and I was looking at wanting linalool in there, I went ahead and added lavender and I wanted to have um, uh, other, other uh, uh, health benefits from it. So I added, you know, I wanted borneo in there. So I added cinnamon, you know, start looking around at what these other things and what their benefits are and then putting them together to create the best. And then you have to search out either the best cultivar or the best grouping of cultivars together to get those ratios that you're looking for. That's a, that's a very similar way at how Medicine Box develops products. When, of course. When people ask me, how do you come up with those formulations? It's, it's very similar to that. It's looking at what the cannabinoids do, what the terpenes do, and we use botanicals from the, the plant world in conjunction with that and really starting with the effect that we want and reverse engineering it from that. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned cinnamon, linalool, beta caryophylline, uh, Taming THC, Ethan Russo's publication, that's like my Bible, it on, lives on my desktop. But uh, you know, he really goes in to the different combinations of, of the terpenes and cannabinoids. For example, CBD in uh, combination with beta caryophylline is great for people that are coming off of opiates because it blocks the oh, yeah. receptors. So uh, there's a lot of uh, detail in the fine print that you can extrapolate on when you make um, medicine. And that's uh, definitely differs from how big pharma takes their approach with single molecule. So, yes, yes. Um, you know, I spoke, I'm uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go for it. Go. So I, I, I spoke at the International Cannabinoid-Based Pharmaceutical Conference in Boston right before COVID hit. And uh, Ethan was there. And um, I was the only person who delivered a study. It was, all, it was all a bunch of scientists delivering studies from, you know, GW, but from like Roche and, and Glaxo Welcome and all the big pharmaceutical companies. And they're all doing research with cannabinoids you know mm -hmm. they're all trying to figure out a way to jump onto this bandwagon and i was the only one that gave a lecture on a study on full spectrum whole plant medicine and i cannot tell you how interested so many people were but the the pharma just doesn't get it they're all trying to figure out the mechanism of action and it just doesn't matter it yeah. doesn't matter it works yeah and I think that's the, the hang up with pharma is that uh, they probably know it works, but you can't isolate and patent whole plant. Right. Right. And then right. with, and there is going to be a slight variance with whole plant medicine. Maybe you could speak to that, that it's not always going to be consistent over time, especially if you're depending on a cultivar that is, you know, grown year after year or in different terroirs and regions right. of the country, never mind in California. Right. Now, how do you how do you stay uh, consistent as possible when you're working with you know healthcare professionals and academia 
and even patients when they're using local extracts to have a consistent, reliable therapeutic dose. Time right. right. Well, that's a very, very good question. And it's a little bit of the holy grail. Mm -hmm. um, so people often ask me, you know, if I'm anti single molecule and it's like, absolutely not. I think it has its use and where it has its use is in standardization. If I have a, and I think you and I've talked about this before, if, um, if a medicine is being standardized at 30 milligrams per mil of the, the primary cannabinoid, and it has, you know, 2% of, uh, uh, two or 3% total of the terpene profile. And you have the breakdown of that, of the top five of them. If you have a formulation that you've created, and let's say instead of 30 milligrams per mil of, the, of THC, let's just use it for now, instead it comes up to 27, 28, 25. You can standardize that by adding from an isolate or a distillate a single uh, amount to get it up to that 30 so that it's standardized. I do believe though, that by, when you have whole plant, even when you standardize the top level, uh, most predominant cannabinoids and terpenes, there's still gonna be tremendous variance beneath that. And I think that's a good thing because as long as your top level stuff is consistent, you can have enough variance that people don't seem to become as dose dependent as they do um, to where it no longer, I don't know if that's the right word, but to where that particular dose over time no longer is doing what it needs to do and they have to increase. Um, I have found that when people have slight variances in their medicines, they're able to stay at a particular dose over a much, much longer period of time, years without having to increase because the body gets just a little bit stressed by it. And it might take a day or so to get accustomed to the new one, but nothing major. You certainly awesome. don't have to start from the beginning. Yeah. You've mentioned a couple studies, Mara. Um, any studies you've participated in that you'd like to share with us? Well, I've, I mean, I've studied, I've, I've participated within the one, obviously, that we did with uh, in 2018 on breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess, like you could, I could send you a link if you don't have it right now. It's, it's the uh, about the entourage effect and uh, full botanical preparation. It's so funny. Manuel Guzman from Complutense University uh, came up with that botanical uh, uh, verbiage because no um, high level uh, publication would publish our study because it involved cannabis. So we had to use like tricks around the verbiage or the name of it in order to get accepted into a high level um, uh, high impact factor uh, publication. Um, and uh, I'm happy to send you a link if you don't have it and you can put it up on your website or whatever you'd like to do. And then um, the one that, that came out that, that uh, Gregor put on LinkedIn the other day, I did not, I wasn't directly involved, but it was my formulation that was then standardized and trialed through Zolera. Um, I consult on all sorts of, of, of studies that are being done now. I know that we work with one in Australia on CanPal on um, uh, uh, pain in horses. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's using it for veterinary medicine and things like mm -hmm. that. So, awesome. yeah. And uh, final question before we jump into uh, Q and A from the audience and thank mm -hmm. you audience for hanging out. I'm watching the participants and it's been steady at like 41 here, which is huge. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Um, loaded question and a big one. And I know you probably don't have all the answers, but what will it take? How long will it take to remove the stigma from THC and see it used alongside the less psychoactive cannabinoids? Uh, yeah, loaded question. So every time I read in the news about some person that's been diagnosed with cancer and, you know, some big name person that's been diagnosed with, uh, uh, like uh, Christiana Anamapur from uh, CBNN just uh, uh, came out that she has ovarian cancer. I'm thinking, oh, if I could just reach them mm. and get her started on this so that she can start talking about it. 
it, you know, when, when Ted Kennedy had, I was like, oh God, please, please, please. When John McCain, I was like, please ask, you know, I even had people that reached out to him trying to get him to just try it, you know? And so I think that it's going to take it a personal experience, you know? Um, Sanjay Gupta was, you know, he was on, if you looked at, at the uh, marijuana pros and cons, he was the con on there until he saw with his own eyes what cannabis can you do. Now, that was in fact a CBD dominant, but there was THC in the original Charlotte's Web. It's not there now because it's now hemp, but it certainly was at the original. Um, and so he said, wow, I was wrong. Um, so I think that it's gonna take it affecting directly um, uh, somebody or some group of bodies that are going to see the potential. I also think that it's not going to get legalized until the federal government has, has established an infrastructure to control it. That's not in place right now. And until it is, they're too afraid of it. Pharma is too powerful of a lobby and it's too yeah. afraid of it. So we're going to have to find a way to sit at the table with big pharma and the, and the federal government to get them to play nicely with some sort of a quality medicine um, and until that happens, I don't see the, the feds changing their regulations. You know, I'm on the board of a of North Bay Credit Union. We yeah. give um, uh, accounts to cannabis businesses and we're asked this all the time, you know, what's it gonna take? I mean, even on the banking, it's just the feds want to make sure they're controlling the way of the rollout. And that's the big, the big uh, block on yeah. it. Yeah, so uh, changing the belief system, that takes a, a long while and running with the devil a little bit or jumping in bed with the devil at the table. With pharma. I mean, it's, it's just that, the reality of it, you know? It's inevitable, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. pharma isn't, pharmaceuticals are not innately negative. They are not innately bad. I take pharmaceuticals every day of my life and I'm so grateful that I have them. One mm -hmm. of them, I have a heart condition and without it, I would you know, my life would be much, much shorter. Yeah. And, um, and cannabis doesn't, doesn't do it. It's not a panacea. So that's one in, example in particular. So pharma, pharma it's, it's big pharma with a capital P that is like what we've seen with the opioid uh, yeah. crisis and Oxycontin and things like that. But I think that there's been a little bit of a rehabilitation of pharma's um, reputation because of the way that the vaccines were developed very quickly and, and rolled out very quickly. Um, so, uh, you know, you have to, you have to learn how to play nice with the bad guys in order to get what you want, because if you stay on the other side, then you're just us versus them. Yep. But if you're willing to come along and say, let me help you do it better. Let me help you do it right. Then right. it's a different conversation. You're not coming from negativity. Right. Or you know, plants over pills. I mean, that can be pretty yeah. harmful, right? That, exactly. That whole mantra out there. And I think uh, one conversation we had a couple years ago, you had you advised me on something. You said, Brian, don't play dirty because they're going to play dirty. That's right. Play nice. Maybe. And I think you referenced Aunt Zelda in that, like your aunt, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Where you learned that from. And I always think oh, about yeah. that. It's like, as much as I want to play dirty, someone's always going to play dirty. So uh, great advice all around in life and in, in business. And moving into questions, David H. Uh, was wondering if we could link the studies of dosage of age versus weight. Do you have anything there you could share? I don't, unfortunately, other than I've started hearing my words coming out of other people's mouths, <laughs> which is always a good sign. And I'm talking other people, I mean, like physicians and, and when studies are being created and stuff. Um, uh, when I first got in this, people were always about, you know, milligrams per kilogram. And when I started showing that the data I had around glioblastoma multiforme in particular, where I had a seven-year-old child on on over 500 milligrams of THC and CBD a day. And I had a 70 year old patient or we had, I don't have patients, but we had, and he was on about 75 milligrams and having the same effect. It was a pretty, it was pretty drastic example. 
um, of how high you can tie to create a young person versus how how uh, more limited it is. And, and these are all generalizations. You're always going to have your outlier where you're going to have somebody who's taking ridiculously high amounts, and that's what it requires at a high at a at a greater age than it does at others. Yeah. And uh, the milligrams per milliliter for David too, I saw this come up when we were talking about, you know, one milligram go up to two and a half. I think he's right. wondering what the, the volume to the carrier. Right. right. Is. You know, interestingly, um, that's, I, I think if, on my TED talk, I did, a, I think I do a couple of slides on milligrams versus milliliters and explaining that one's a, one's a weight and one's a volume. And uh, milligrams, we're talking about the weight of the molecules, the weight of the and not the actual carrier oil that it's in. Right. That's all, always a challenge when we're labeling products, isn't it? You know, and, and getting that uh, education across to the consumer. Well, two and a half milligrams of what? Well, of whole plant extract. Well, it's in liquid. What do you mean? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be a challenge. Uh, Justin, I'm a Smox team member. Uh, do you have a link to the breast cancer study? Uh, Patricia may have linked that. Uh, Let me see if I NIH.gov, PubMed. It's definitely on PubMed. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't, I don't know the number of it to know if this is it or not. Yep. But if you, if you go to it and it's, um, and it has yep. my name had, on it anywhere. Patricia linked that. Okay, perfect. I'm wondering if it's perfect. Patricia I'm thinking of. Um, I know a few. Uh, Stephanie, also a, a Medicine Box teammate. Uh, why hasn't Delta 8 taken over the hemp CBD craze? Cost, education, lack thereof. It's not legal. <laughs> it's flat out people, not legal. People are trying though, right? Like you they're said. They're trying and they're getting letters from the DEA and they're getting, you know, and it's just going to be a matter of time before their assets are confiscated for okay. illegal drug dealing, whether we like it or not. That's just the way it works. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, um, it, opportunists, carpetbaggers, yeah, hustlers. All the, all I, like the above. You, I like how you call it the hemp hustler. Yeah, I used to be a cannabis hustler back in the day, so I can relate. Um, company for January, companies are making Delta Eight from leftover hemp biomass. Is that a good product? What's a safe, good Delta Eight product? Well, I mean, it's as safe a product as anything that's made from leftover and, and isolated. Um, so I would not recommend using it. Um, I'm not familiar right now with who's coming out with a full spectrum, uh, uh, what we call full spectrum whole plant Delta 8. Do you yeah. know of any, Brian? I don't. I, I just know the manufacturing process is pretty excruciating and it's very... Uh, the use of a lot of synthetic um, right. materials. Right. To get and the, the yield is very small. The yield yeah. is very small from all that. So it's outrageously expensive to right. process it. Right. Yeah. So uh, Ben Gonzalez actually chimed in at what uh, January's question. That is the burning question about D8. The production methods involve a series of steps using strong acids, bases, and catalysts to push the double bond of carbon to shift positions. Right unless properly re, uh, remedied from the final product, those chemicals can be potentially harmful. That's a uh, much more scientific way than I just explained it. Um, lots of chemicals. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, I yeah. Mean, Shoving a watermelon through a straw to get just a little bit of product out there. Right. Uh, now I wonder why FDA hasn't approved Kevin Vickery. Thanks, Ben. Nice to see you on here, Kevin. Uh, Liz R, a uh, question from Mara. Any insight on interaction of specific cannabinoids and hyperemeric hyper yeah. syndrome? Yeah. I have anecdotal yeah. reports from patients who had the syndrome with THC, but when switching to THCA, was able to get same relief as THC, but with cessation of hyperemeric symptoms. Well, first of all, um, uh, hyperemesis syndrome is a uncontrolled vomiting that has been associated in some people um, after consuming large amounts of, of THC. The one thing that I often tell people is that THC is biphasic, possibly triphasic. And the exact same thing that you're using it for, it may actually cause, like we can use uh, THC with patients that are suffering like from chemo-induced nausea and things like that 
but then if they take too much, it can actually add and make them more nauseated. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of those people. Cannabis has made me sick many, many times when I've taken too much. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the difference between THCA and THC is they, they're, they, the way they act in the body is completely different. Um, THCA still has the acid molecule. And as a result, it does not bind to the receptors of CB1 and CB2. Uh, so you're not gonna have the same, it's the same effect from it one way or the other. Depending on when you say it worked for you the same way that you hear stories anecdotally of it working the same way that THC did, it depends on what you're treating. If you're treating inflammation, then I can see that being the case. If you're treating um, uh, uh, seizure disorders or nausea and things like that, I can see that being the case. If you're treating uh, uh, anti-tumoral or uh, uh, in, uh, insomnia and things like that, it's questionable whether it would work the same. Great. So because cannabis works for so many different um, health issues, so many of them, it's really almost impossible to generalize about what works for what works, like what works for what, you know, you have to be very specific with it. Well, if you know Alice Moon, she's very outspoken yeah. about that. Right. Yeah. You know, I, we had a patient who um, there have been theories about it, that it has to do with a particular um, and I'm, it's, it's skipping my mind at the moment, but there's a particular product that's commonly used in the growing process um, that has, um, there's some theories out there. I know that Dr. Jody Goldstrich, who used to work with us um, and our patients, um, he had a theory that when you saw plants that had been grown with that, there was a higher likelihood of hyperemesis than without it. Um, I can tell you that we have never had a, a patient report this, but I did have a patient who moved to uh, Utah and she was accessing also not legally, but she was accessing from somebody else and uh, she did develop this. And the only thing I could say is that it, that there was no way to know whether it had been treated when it was grown with this process, these chemicals. Yeah. Yeah, lots to demystify, right? Uh, ben, uh, back to the Delta-8, uh, he says, that's not quite a definitive answer, but a generalization of just one issue with D8. Another is that while the medicinal and adult use markets are highly regulated, especially for contaminant and safety testing, the hemp CBD industry is not. Right. Great point. Most states do not require any safety contaminant testing for any hemp CBD products, which is astonishing to me. Like why, uh, Mara, you mentioned, you know, you were testing back in, you know, 2011. And yeah, 2011. Yeah. And I think that's what really gravitated me towards you. It's like, we didn't have to test, but we did right. anyway. And we remember yeah. having a relationship with Santa Cruz Labs back in, in 2014 and, and spending hundreds of dollars testing different extracts and, and, and products that I was making in my, right. my home kitchen just to understand all of this stuff. And thank goodness I did. Yeah. And you know something, Brian, anything that goes in or on your body should be tested. Anything that goes in or on your body needs to have some level of regulation. I'm not talking about like, you know, black shirts coming in. I'm talking about regulation for safety. And so that the, because the average consumer is 100% cannabis naive. The, the, you know, the vast majority of people out there, they should be entitled to have safe products out there without having to go and look up COAs and do all that. They should just be able to take it the same way that we can, you know, we can trust that when we buy our fruit and vegetables yep. that they have been a certain way. So it's really important that, that, that the hemp, I, I was 100% for the farm bill because of uh, the ability to grow and process hemp for industrial purposes. As soon as they made it a CBD uh, story, I just, I lost faith in them and uh, lost, they've lost my support. Right. Uh, from Stephanie, uh, curious if Brian or Mara have connected with the godfather himself, Dr. Raphael Mashulam. I never have, I would love to. Uh, I I have, have many looked? times, many times, have? What's many he like? times with him and his wife. And I've, yeah, I know them very well. And he is amazing. He's wonderful. He's like a very sweet man. 
He's kind, he's yeah. brilliant, he's absolutely as active as you can even imagine. On the other hand, though, he and I have had some pretty heated discussions because he is a uh, molecular biologist. He is not a, a physician and for, he shouldn't be giving opinions on treating patients because he has never treated a patient. And he is a little bit THC adverse, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, and single molecule more supporting, but that's because he's in a lab doing research. He's also 86 or seven years, however old he is now. And so he's gonna have a little bit different perspective on it. I love the man, I love his wife. Um, I, I love the work he's do, He's done and God help us, we're all here because of him. Yeah. Uh, right? But you know, it's time to have the next level of opinions on this, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe the changing of the guard or, or a little bit. Yeah, it's not the same. It's not the same uh, as it was back when he was doing this work and, you know, uh, uh, putting hash in his backpack and taking it on, an, on a bus so he could go study it, you yeah. know, back in the day. Thanks for OG. Uh, maybe we'll have part two of this with me moderating a very healthy debate and show people how it's okay to have healthy conflict without having to cancel each other out. A whole other topic. <laughs> oh my God, Brian, don't yeah. even, I mean, you and I could talk hours no. on that. Oh my Brian, God. No. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I mean, I disagree with a lot of people, but if they're, if their intentions are good, then, you know, that's you how we learn and I'll do me. Yeah. You know, I always say, so I joined Clubhouse. I don't like it. I'm not on there, but I, I tried it out and I looked at it. And um, I think I have in my bio something like I have a lot of really strong opinions. But then when I get new information, sometimes I change my opinion because that's what an educated, intelligent, thoughtful person does. Right. When you know better, you do better. Yeah. Uh, Justin here, uh, there's a lot of work in quote, stacking psychedelics, both micro and macro with cannabis. Do you see any potential in working with some of these medicines alongside THC? Yes, I do. I do. Um, there's some people that are much more knowledgeable than, well, than I am on this. Um, obviously, you know, the people at MAPS, uh, Dr. Harry McElroy, who's been working with our patients for about seven years now. He's, he's uh, one of the certified MAPS people and all, and then he works with uh, even things like ketamine and, and, and other uh, psychedelics along with cannabis, of course. But I think that, that there's tremendous uh, a possibility of, of, of working them and stacking them, as they call it, together to help to ameliorate some of the um, extent of the psychoactivity that could come from some of these uh, psychedelics that could be too much for some people. Mm -hmm. um, and cannabis tends to, to temper some of that down. Um, I, I, I had the uh, unique opportunity um, down in Colombia one time. I was, I was in a, a, a kind of a cool group of, of people, and we were with some indigenous uh, group down there, and they were passing around DMT with uh, 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 cannabis uh, ground flower in there and chamomile. Oh, wow. And it was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. It was, it was a, it created a sense of being with the group that I'll never forget. It was, it was life changing. And I think that when we use psychedelics, especially when we use them along with some of the uh, cannabinoids or in sometimes when we use them together, we can, we can fast track uh, therapy and issues and things that people have been dealing with sometimes their whole life, they might need 30 years of, of, of therapy or three hours of using some, some of these drugs. Right. Yeah. A, a, a full on quantum leap into the macrocosm of the universe. Exactly. Um, and we, we need that here in our culture. Uh, we, mm -hmm. are, we are falling apart. Uh, do you find that botanical non-cannabis or hemp terpenes, uh, like you mentioned in your topicals, have the effects as cannabis-derived terpenes? Are the molecules exactly the same? Adding botanical terpenes to cannabis terpenes beneficial? Is there a point of diminished returns on 
uh, levels of cannabinoids or concerns about blocking other cannabinoids connecting to receptors? That's an amazing question. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, I think that um, it is a good question. I think that um, a molecule is a molecule. There's just no difference between a molecule that comes from a, a terpene that's from cannabis derived or a terpene that's derived from another plant. Um, uh, what I, where I, where I find that the breakdown is that people tend to think if a little is good, more is going to be better. And that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, some of these medicines that I see out there that are, you know, Frankenstein with like a single molecule of a cannabinoid, and then they add a few terpenes, they're putting far too much in there. Um, and, and there's a, and it's, it's more nuanced than that. So uh, just the way I said that there's a, there's a role for isolates and distillates in standardization of getting things to a reliable milligrams per mil or however you're trying to do it, the same thing goes for terpenes. But I think that it's really important to first look at, uh, do a, do a, take a lab result, a COA on a, um, a, a flower and look at what the ratios are of the cannabinoids and terpenes that are in there or on the, on the, and then do your best to keep those ratios similar in the finished product themselves, assuming that it's one that's been decarboxylated. Thank you, Liz, for that question. Uh, real quick, I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, can you speak to cannabinoids and treatment for PTSD? Yeah, I also think that you should, that's one of the places that's, that psychedelics also has tremendous uh, potential. Um, I, I, I've seen that with many patients that have, that are coming with PTSD and there's also a condition that I call, that's called CPTSD, which is more of a complex. And so many people that are living in our culture are dealing with this more complex, uh, PTSD where it's not like you, you're going on with your life and you had a horrible event and then you're going back to your life and you can't get past this, but it's a, constant barragement of, of stressors, um, whether it's a, an abusive childhood, abusive spouse, uh, abusive employer, um, constant poverty, and some of the other things that cause this tremendous stresses. Um, and the profile of the medicine that we have found to be the most beneficial overall in the most general senses are a, a low THC with high um, uh, limonene and uh, alpha-pinene uh, seem to be, so it's the, it's the profile of the medicine that are more like, you know, the sour diesels. Yeah. And a lot of the diesels. The high and, sativas. Yeah. Yes, the ones that used to be called sativas, the narrow leaf. And now, I mean, you look at the, you look at the number of hybrids and you look at what the genetics are now and they're, they're meaningless terminology, but, when you look at the medicines that actually did um, more, more resemble the narrow leaf with the old profiles, it's gonna be the ones that are the more stimulating and the less couch locky, you know, this terminology. Then you wonder why pharmacists and doctors don't uh, yeah. <laughs> adopt it. What's yeah, that? right, right, right. So using, uh, I think it's very important with PTSD that you start out with a very low amount. We found that um, I mean, I know some people and, and uh, Raphael Meshulam is one of them who says that he thinks that CBD is good uh, uh, with um, PTSD. I haven't seen it that much. Um, but then again, I haven't, um, I haven't seen tens of thousands or millions of people. I would love to have people send me their individual experiences with it. But um, PTSD, in fact, we had, uh, we had uh, a woman who came to us a few years ago, I wanna say five or six years ago, and she was complaining of fibromyalgia. And uh, once I started delving into what her issues were, I realized that she had a triggering event before the fibromyalgia symptoms appeared. And so we switched from treating her for inflammatory and all these things, treating her for PTSD, and finally had success in treating them. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, great question here from Andreas. What's up, Andreas? Uh, regarding California's rec market, it seems some of the brands that were in a THC arms race to make 100 milligram doses or higher 
we now see some of those brands reversing course to more microdose, less than five milligram THC per serving. What's your take on this trend? I'm all for it. You know, yeah. one, one of the things that's, that's gotten me crazy this whole time is the, I mean, I think there was a study done in Colorado about a year after they legalized there where they showed that the number of people that were using cannabis on a regular basis after legalization versus the number before was basically the same, you know, taking into account, obviously, uh, tourism and things like that, where people are like, oh, I get a chance to get high because all of a sudden I'm a child. Um, and I think in, in California, you had, you know, this illusion that all of a sudden the 40 million people in California that have been drinking all these uh, wines from Sonoma and Napa and Temecula, all of a sudden they're going to switch to cannabis and it didn't happen. The same, you know, people that were recreating before, for the most part, are recreating with it now. There yeah. are some exceptions, of course, but for the mo and, but for the most part, the ones that have entered into this since legalization are the people that just want to kind of feel a little altered, but they're not looking to get, you know, a blitz on the sofa. They still have to pick their kids up from school, or they still want to, you know, go to work and, and be responsible. So the vast majority of people that use cannabis are using it medically, whether they think they're using it recreationally or not. And if they're in fact using it medically, my definition of the difference between the two is, and I think it's, I'd like to include it if I could here is when, cause God knows Steve D'Angelo and I have argued this point enough times. When you're using cannabis medically, you're using it to remove or eliminate a problem of some sort whether you know, you're using it to get rid of pain or to get rid of your sleeplessness or get rid of PTSD or get rid of anxiety. When you're using it recreationally, you're looking at to enhance or add or build to it. So if you think about that, and then you think about the fact that there doesn't have to be a psychoactivity level that's in any way um, uh, detrimental or in any way interferes with your day-to-day -day life, in order to achieve the elimination of pain, insomnia, anxiety, et cetera. But you have to feel it to get to a recreational level. So I would, assume, I would, I would suggest that these companies that are reversing down to micro are recognizing the fact that they have a finite market in the adult use for the heavy, heavy users. And if they want to keep building and expanding their market, they have to reach out to that more self-medicated wellness over-the-counter type uh, patient or consumer? That's a great, great answer to a great question. Uh, do you support legal home growing as part of a, a re-legalization? Any structures you think are appropriate? I, 100%. I am 100% a, a yeah. proponent of, of self-grow. Where I start having issues is when people start making medicine and selling it to people and they aren't lab testing and they're doing all that. If you want to make it for you and your immediate household and whatever, but if you're to start making it and going on Facebook and claiming you're an expert and selling or, or providing it, then you need to have lab tests and too many home growers are not lab testing. So um, that would really be, but I'm a hundred percent. I think people should be able to grow their own medicine, make their own medicine out of it, create products, whatever they want to do, as long as they're doing it for themselves and their immediate family. I agree. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of cruise through some last ones here. Patricia says she's following up uh, around 1000 patients and totally agree that weight is definitely not as important as age for the strategic, strategic doses. I actually just learned something new today by that. I learned a lot today, but that was a big one. Um, thank you. And I want to say thanks to Ben Gonzalez for being the Delta 8 uh, expert in the chat room. Uh, if Patricia, nice to see you on here. Um, Stephanie uh, writes, FDA is releasing 150 million for hemp-based farming cultivation, as long as it's connected to educational program, community college, university. Uh, FDA is offering 10 million increments to hemp-based cultivators, uh, just what our country needs. Let's turn all that uh, mono crop cultures in uh, the, the central uh, uh, center of uh, the United States into hemp 
production and grants can be used for building materials, clothing, fabrics. V uh, is studying at the CCI right now so I can make the best decisions to help others on the same journey. Amazing to learn from you. Uh, have you come across an effective strain combo for triple plus BC? I am left to self-treat post-surgery and confirmations go a long way. Someone said to dose my 25 to one CBD separately from high THC whole plant oils. So what she's saying is that she has triple positive um, breast cancer. And I'm assuming that's what it is. And if, if that's the case, then interestingly, uh, uh, in our study that we created, that we did with Complutense University, triple ne a triple negative, which is what we're talking about here, um, is was the most responsive, um, and uh, which was very exciting. So what I usually do with that is I have people on a ratio of either one to one or two to one of THC to CBD, and uh, the two in this case to one would be the CBD. And um, uh, she's triple positive. That means she's ERPR positive and HER2 positive. Is that correct, V? You want to say yes or no to that? Um, uh, yes. Okay. So I, I apologize. You're not triple negative. You're uh, ERPR and HER2. That, by the way, interestingly, is what my sister is, is dealing with right now, the same diagnosis. And... Um, uh, I don't want to say there's a, there's a favorite cultivar uh, by any stretch, but the profile of the medicine I would look for is one that does contain, as I often mention, the uh, linalool, beta caryophyllene, uh, limonene, and uh, myrcene. Uh, you know, and if it has alpha pinene and it doesn't bother you, it doesn't hype you up, that's great. On the CBD, I always have, you know, I think I was the first one out there years ago talking about separating them out. And the reason I do that is I give the THC first and I give the CBD a few hours later. Um, so I prefer it that way over having it in a single product, especially when you're dealing with cancers in particular. Um, if it, you know, for other disorders, it's not as imperative to me, but we don't have enough research yet. And so we need to do more. And in the meantime, CBD is a, is a weak ag, uh, antagonist of the receptors. So I want to make sure that there's nothing interfering with the uptake of the THC by the receptors. Let it get uptake, let it do all that before you then introduce the CBT, other than what's just native in the plant. Great answer. Let's finish it off with uh, kidding, but not kidding. Mara, you're tuning in from uh, Mexico. Where are you in I Mexico? Am. I'm actually in Todos Santos. Um, which is down in Baja, California, Sur. I'm just about an hour uh, southwest of La Paz and about an hour north of Cabo San Lucas in a little microclimate here mm -hmm. and uh, 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 enjoying the good life. Surf's up in Mexico apparently equals legal now on cannabis. Have you seen any cannabis down there? No, it's not. It's, it's, it's there. They, they, are putting the infrastructure in at the government level now to figure out the rollout. In fact, um, a good friend of mine here's uh, uncle is the governor. And um, we're talking about being able to help to influence some of the, uh, uh, the regulatory rollout of it. There was just an election here on the 6th of June and the party that, that is in control um, is one that should be very supportive. But um, I'm actually the keynote speaker in an event the 1st of September in Cancun that's being um, uh, done by uh, Cannabis Salud, uh, Lorena Bitram, who is just a tireless proponent for cannabis in Mexico. It's her organization. And so, you know, she, she asked, and I, of course, said yes. Um, uh, and so I think that that will be, you know, hopefully by then we'll have some, uh, better idea of how it's going to roll out. We, I was actually asked to speak at an event, uh, next week in, I think the next week or the 25th or something of June in Mexico city. And they were going to be talking about the rollout of it. And I was like, how do you know what the rollout is going to look like when you don't even have the infrastructure set up yet? There is no regulation. There is no, you're just going to be 
bunch of people sitting on a stage making up stuff so you could push your products. And I'm not interested in participating in any of that. That's not Mars stage. No, no, no. Unless they want me just screaming hyperbole the whole time, you know, against it. Do that. Yeah. Ready? Here's your mic. Ready, set, go. Don't right. Drop mic for the next six hours. Uh, okay. And just some quick questions. Favorite, real quick. Favorite cannabinoid? THC. Duh. Favorite terpene? Limonene. And favorite combination of cannabinoid and terpene? Uh, probably uh, THC, limonene, linalool, beta caryophylline, borneol, um, uh, humulene. Uh, there's a lot of them. Obviously, you want to have beta caryophylline and everything. Yes. So, yeah. Always, yes, very well balanced. Uh, all right. Well, uh, that's enough uh, for today, everybody. Um, thank you all for participating. Mara, uh, on the behalf of myself and Medicine Box, we love you so much. Um, thank you for, for joining and being such uh, a proponent for humanity, the cannabis industry, and taking um, all this work uh, to the next level and just sticking with it always. Um, it means a lot to everyone out there. Um, Everyone that entered is automatically um, entered for the full suite of uh, Medicine Box One Cap products. Those are a hemp-based product, so less than 0.3%, but we do use broad spectrum, a variety of herbs and other uh, cannabinoids. And uh, Mara, where can we find you? I know you're not trying to, some of the advice I gave you was not let everyone access you on your calendar, but where can we find you? Oh, gosh. So I'm on Twitter and it's at Mara BG. Um, and then, of course, I'm LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Instagram anymore. I think I still have accounts and I get notices that people are writing to me, but I don't see them. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs me and they have some, you know, burning need. They can always reach me at Mara at AuntZeldas.org. And if I can't help them, I'll, I'll send them to somebody who can. Perfect. Good to hear. And uh, Medicine Box, we are on all the channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, at medicine underscore box. Uh, I am underscore Brian Chaplin. Uh, stay tuned because we will have a lot of this um, content that we just recorded in the form of sizzle reels, audiograms, and then uh, the whole long form audio posted on our YouTube channel. And Mara, we will get those over to you as well so you can Great. share in the appropriate places. Um, thanks again, everyone. Have such a wonderful week and uh, buenos tardes to you, Mara. Have some great guacamole and uh, tortilla soup for me. They make a good tortilla soup in that region. Oh, yeah. Uh, buenos tardes. Okay. And uh, plan your, plan, as long as I think they're going to change the border requirements so you can come down and visit without having to get um, to I'm looking forward to it. Maybe when I go next to this time, I won't get COVID. Right. That would be get, good. <laughs> we'll talk about the vaccine there too. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank All you. Right, Thanks so much. Cheers. Ciao.